Hi everyone, I'm Hori, I'm a PhD student at Cardiff Met in my last year. My topic is co-housing. And today, contrary to what's written on the paper, I'm going to uh, talk to you about the environmental benefits of the co-housing setting compared to a mainstream setting. Uh, well, before we start, I have to... Oh, sorry. I come here. Yeah, I need to stand, you know, with the southern stuff. So before we start, I give you a brief overview of my research so you understand where I'm coming from. Basically, I'm looking uh, to see if um, a co-housing model could be implemented in the context of Wales. And that has two dimensions, as Tam Tamsin knows very well, the housing, um, the housing stock in Wales. There have been some uh, report commissioned by the Welsh government showing that there is a critical lack of affordable housing. Uh, that puts a lot of pressure, especially on rural communities where young people are forced, in a way, to migrate to cities in order to, to find jobs and housing. And as such, the Welsh government is looking at some, uh, let's say, alternative options to, to improve the, the housing stock. Basically, they are supposed to be more sustainable and more affordable. So, as mentioned but by um, some other people today, they, they are looking at uh, resident managed schemes, um, at schemes that encourage environmental behavior, um, at repurposing like the old housing stock and, and bringing it into use. So, Sustainability, sustainability aspects like, like these ones. And if you look at the literature on co-housing, you will see that it appears to be, broadly, a more sustainable and affordable way of living compared to, the, to traditional mainstream norms. There are some um, <coughs> research done on North American communities which shows that on average a person living in co-housing uses like 60% less energy, like 30% less space and 10% less goods. And there is also a tendency to, in, in um, co-housing communities to, to have a lower individual ownership of appliances like washing machine, lawn mowers, even second cars. Uh, so basically, basically what this suggests is that for, a, let's say for a given standard of life and type of housing, a uh, co-housing setting appears to give their residents uh, opportunities for a more sustainable lifestyle. So keeping the, this in mind, I... Wait a bit. There we go. So keeping this in mind, I um, went to Denmark, Sweden, the UK here, and the Netherlands, and had, a, had an, a look at co-housing communities over there. I chose these countries because, uh, well, basically they are the cradle of co-housing. I've seen communities there who have been developed 40 years ago and are still going strong. So the lessons you would learn from these ones are, are, are quite important. Um, I interviewed 46 people and, well, it was always an issue of finding a balance between the in-depth, uh, the information you would get from the, from the, um, from the interviews and the um, time scale, let's say, of the study, because my view was that you need to have a holistic approach towards co-housing community to uh, communities to understand them. So I had to, to look at design, motivation, architecture, daily management, relation to local authorities, participatory process, sustainability, so more aspects of life. Today I'm just going to talk about environmental sustainability. It will be difficult to do it in half an hour anyway, so I'm, I apologize for now, Tamsin, but I promise to do my best. <laughs> okay, I'll um, get directly into the topic. I know that some people have mentioned uh, co-housing already, so I will not get into the definition or the details. What I'm just going to say about this is that from my point of view, co-housing is an issue of balance. And this, from my point of view, again, delimitates it from the other intentional communities. Uh, I remember I spoke to, to a Danish resident and he said that if you look at co-housing, you have a broad spectrum. On one extreme, you have more sharing, 
more common activities, so a bit more characteristic, let's say, of, of the communes. And on the other spectrum, they are just like mainstream, but people um, taking advantage of, of living together. And co-housing communities can be anywhere on that spectrum. It's, it depends on the, on the people, I suppose, and maybe a bit on, the, on their mentality, on, on their needs, and on the countries from, from where they come from. Uh, I'm going to touch these characteristics later in my discussion, so I'm, I'm just going to skip that for now. Okay, so, um, well, what my research shows is that there are four main categories due to which co-housing represents a more environmentally sustainable setting compared to, well, traditional uh, mainstream norms. And... Um, First of all, and this is quite important, it, has, it appears to have a positive influence on their residents. Uh, reports have shown that just by shifting the behavior of people, you can use between 10 and 30 percent less energy and associated uh, carbon emissions. And this has the environmental behavior of people has been an important argument in all sustainability frameworks. So basically, uh, environmental behavior is uh, determined by two factors. First of all, as you all probably know, we have these uh, financial considerations. I mean, I've spoken to people in co-housing and they told me, yeah, we would love to be more sustainable, but the development process took so many years. We're tired. We don't have money anymore. If we would have money, we would do it, but we don't. That is something more. Uh, this is something more personal and more um, difficult, let's say, to challenge. But pro uh, environmental behavior is also influenced by non-economic aspects like um, background, education, ethics, and well, more important for these discussions, trust in the community, social networks, whether. Um, you value collective self-interest and the provision of information. And this is of importance uh, for co-housing because co-housing tend to be uh, uh, communities with quite a high social capital. Social uh, capital, just to be very quick, refers to the interactions between uh, individuals and collective and the high social capital. It's supposed to be a win-win situation, both for the individual and for the collective. Some research has shown that there is a positive link between a, a high social capital and a positive environmental behavior. Now, co-housing, and here I'm going back to what some of you have mentioned, uh, is a setting which <coughs> definitely enhances the bonds between residents. I, I'm talking about bonds now. You have this participatory development process, which means that uh, it takes a couple of years for a group of people uh, to move into co-housing. In those years, as you very well know, they, talk, they decide about all the aspects of life in their future community. They look, look at the financial situation. They, they do basically everything. And this is an opportunity for people to know each other. It's obviously a very difficult process, which filters people in and out. But at the end, when they move in, uh, it's a more cohesive community. People have bonds. Besides that, in co-housing communities, as in other communities, as has been mentioned before, there are some common activities, some compulsory, some voluntary, uh, which, which forces people to, to encourages people to, to interact and to know each other. The common meals are the most obvious example about, for this in co-housing. In most of the communities I have visited, people are uh, supposed to be part of a cooking group once every few weeks, depending on the size of the community and the frequency of uh, common meals. And this represents uh, uh, an important glue between residents. Besides that, you have all, type of, all types of activities from music nights, movie projection, watching football, to maintenance of the community, to doing field trips broad spectrum. So w what I'm trying to say is that because of all these common activities and because of the design, which I will mention later, of the communities, people know each other much better 
than they would know in a, um, in a normal setting. That they, it's a different type of relationships, basically. And even though you, what my, um, my respondent said, that, that you can't be friends with anyone, you most definitely have closer ties. And this is important in the discussion about environmental behavior, because what I have noticed is that um, in each community, regardless of the site, so the communities I visited have been ranging between 25 and 200 people. There is bound to be someone who is knowledgeable on environmental practices or who has an environmental interest. So what this means is that because of the, the social capital and the bonds between residents, people have an easier access to such knowledgeable uh, uh, residents. And it happens that um, <coughs> in, many of the in the many of the communities that I have visited, that um, because of such people, working groups focused on making their community more sustainable are developed. They're looking at anything from using solar panels, geothermal panels, uh, to the occupancy, the behavior of, of people. And this impacts um, quite a lot, actually, uh, the practices of residents in co-housing, something that do does not happen in mainstream. Because people who, for example, are recycling incorrectly are, are getting told. Some interviewees have mentioned that because there are some strong environmental norms in their community, then don't, they don't fly so often, flying being a non-environmental transport mode. And most importantly, if you have buildings with high, um, high efficient buildings, like passive house standards, Operating them is uh, not necessarily an easy thing, and incorrect operation might, might really reduce their benefits. Living in co-housing, where people can talk to each other, can compare themselves to each other, enhances uh, their possibility to better operate such buildings. Okay, that was one. Twenty left to go. That was a joke. <laughs> Okay, uh, this <laughs> the second thing is, um, is related to the waste management. I mean, waste has been a central issue in sustainability discussion since 30 years ago. Uh, you find waste um, management strategy from EU level to Cardiff neighborhood level. Uh, all this what all these strategies emphasize is the fact that it is more appropriate to try to minimize and prevent waste than actually to treat it. Well, there are some research who, who argue about that, but all the policy frameworks are based on, on this hierarchy. And what I've noticed in a, um, in a Northwest European co-housing environment is that they enhance um, the possibility of their residents to um, attain these top two levels of the, of the waste uh, hierarchy, especially. First of all, it's because of the common meal system. If you cook for more people, you tend to waste less food. And what residents have mentioned is that uh, because they have to cook every five, six, seven weeks, depending on the size of the community, they tend to get better and better in time. So they waste less food. Uh, another really interesting thing about this is that most of the community, especially in Sweden and Denmark, they have a really very strict and organized uh, meal system. Like computerized, where the cook know exactly how many people come, who is vegetarian, who doesn't, and so on. And what also happened is that if there are some leftovers after the common dinners, uh, they put them back into the freeze freezer or refrigerator, and people can come with a lunchbox and use it the next day for work or children for school. This is, happens mostly for free or either for a very, very low fee this whole common meal system reduces food waste. Imagine comparing it to eating on your own, in your own house, 50 separate families. The second thing is that because of the um, high social capital I mentioned earlier, people are much more inclined to swap or to borrow things. Uh, some of the communities have like dedicated swap rooms where they put everything from teddy bears to books to chairs to 
God knows what, maintenance, um, ustensils, and stuff like this. I remember one, uh, one Danish lady, she has three very, very young children, and she told me that she never had to buy any piece of clothing for the children because um, that is a community with a lot of families with, uh, with parents with kids. And other children were growing older and they were just using those, putting those clothes in the swapping room and they didn't need them anymore and they could just use them freely. This is just one example. And usually they, uh, co-housing residents mentioned that there is a huge amount of borrowing going on from milk and butter to cars or whatever. An interesting comparison is um, about the gardening tools. So there is this community in, um, in Denmark, uh, about 100 people, no one had ever had to buy any tools because they are all shared in the community and they compare it to their neighbors just in front of them, like a standard street. There are 25 terraced houses and in each of the gardens there is a wheelbarrow, there is a lawnmower, there is a shovel and whatever. And he actually showed me the gardens are, uh, I don't exaggerate, I think they are four or five square meters. So half of the garden is taken by, the, by those tools. So again, this is important in minimizing and reusing uh, uh, tools. Oh, okay, and last about waste is uh, the possibility to compost. I remember a specific example from Stockholm. Generally in Sweden, uh, the local authorities organized composting for of organic waste. They somehow didn't do it in Stockholm. And the people told me that it is so much easier to organize it, to manage it, and to find space for it in co-housing than it would be if they would live on their own and they wouldn't have the same interactions with their neighbors. Okay. What I have, have also noticed is that co-housing communities tend to use the site more efficiently due to something called design for social interaction. And I'm actually going to show you some examples and discuss on, uh, on basis of them. So, um, well, you probably know very well because you're doing this now and Ms. Branton as well. Um, when talking about design in co-housing, one of the main aims is to facilitate spontaneous interactions between neighbors. Uh, actually, design, in the, in the words of Duret, who's quite famous in the, for United States co-housing, is that design is the one that keeps co-housing community in place in the longer term. Some strategies that I have noticed is that people, uh, that co-housing communities tend to be uh, car-free within the premises. So uh, parking lots are usually corralled, placed at the edge of the site. People have to walk from their car to the home. Again, this increases social interaction. One of, one of the things. The second thing I notice is that if you have small individual gardens in front of your house, you don't tend to fence it like we normally do in mainstream settings. They leave, it they leave them open, which creates a big sensation of space and which also shows the openness to the community but uh, encourages interaction because you can see who is in the common house, let's say, or you can see across the community to your neighbors. These are just two, um, uh, two aspects. And also, um, in the way they design the buildings, they try to achieve a gradual transition from community space to private space. So, for example, this is a community called Hestia. Maybe Ms. Brenton knows it. It's close to Amsterdam. I don't know. It's been developed 30 years ago or something like that. And they, as you can see, the um, houses are facing inwards towards a common green. On this side, you have like kitchens and living room, and on the other side of the houses, where it's supposed to be the private space, you have the the bedrooms and more private rooms. So this is um, usually a gradual transition that is uh, is quite uh, common in co-housing. Now, from an environmental point of view, what I have noticed is that there is an um, emphasis on creating outdoor spaces in which people can socialize. And most of the times, actually all of the times, those outdoor spaces are, uh, are green with vegetation. They, they may, might have playgrounds for children or sheds for tools or so on, 
but there is a lot of vegetation going on. I'm, I'm not going to go into details, but obviously green influences well-being, can act as a temperature um, neutralizer, it can isolate against noise, and it has various uh, advantages. The second thing I have, I have noticed is that in co-housing communities, which are comprised of multiple dwellings, I think Ms. Burnton has mentioned that you also have co-housing communities clustered in one dwelling, especially in, in bigger cities where there is no space. And people, instead of having individual homes, they have uh, flats. Anyway, the, in such multi-dwelling communities, um, there, ten there is a tendency of um, using terraced housing as a housing form. Terraced houses are more compact. They use less of the site, and they are more energy efficient. I remember a UK report stating that terrace houses are between 25% in the summer and 30% in the winter more energy efficient than detached housing. And, well, since all co-housing communities I have seen, I'm, I'm not saying all of them are like this, but there is a, a pattern of using this form of housing. It is let's say a secondary uh, result of the design for social interaction, but which is more environmentally sustainable than, than, uh, than otherwise. Obviously, if you have terrace houses, there is less open envelope. You tend to use less energy and thus uh, less, well, less pollution, I suppose, in the atmosphere. Okay, this is another example I wanted to show. It's um, threshold community in Dorset. Um, the same concept, people leave their uh, cars over there, they have to walk to their home, the homes are open towards an inner courtyard. Uh, there is a transition between the front, open to the community, and the back where the bedrooms are. So this is basically a co-housing design, but again it creates these green spaces which are influencing the well-being of the residents and are more environmentally valid. I don't say that all sites are like this. I just put this um, courtyard, let's say, layout here because they are, well, they make more sense in uh, discussing environmental sustainability, but they can be, for example, Lancaster, you have shown it before, they can be longitudinal. So that's one way of looking at it. Okay. Um, well, the environment itself uh, tends to, to make residents use less energy. This is a debatable issue, I would say, because there have been so far very few, in my point of view, quantitative studies on the sustainability of co-housing. Quantitative meaning looking exactly at their consumption over a longer period of time, comparing them with, with uh, mainstream settings and so on. And those studies who have quantified uh, co-housing in terms of environmental sustainability, actually they stem from, from North America. A more recent study uh, about a senior co-housing community called Fäcknappen in Sweden showed that residents tend to use 20% less uh, energy compared to an uh, average Swedish uh, person. And uh, he, the author attributes that to the common meal system, which I mentioned before, and to reduced personal space. From my study, my study is a qualitative one, but I, there are some themes which have come up very strongly while looking at the, at the interviews. <laughs> One of them is that uh, the environment helps reduce the performance gap between predicted and actual uh, performance of buildings. I've mentioned, I've touched this briefly at the, at the beginning, so performance gap uh, represents a discrepancy between what is actually expected of the use in a building and what actually happens. There are factors like modeling tools, like quality of materials, and uh, especially behavior of the, of the residents which impact this uh, discrepancy. And again, the high social capital in co-housing, having easier access to people who are more knowledgeable environmentally, uh, having people who will uh, 
let you know if you are using the building incorrectly. It helps you improve your uh, occupancy, especially in, case, uh, in the case of high efficiency buildings, thus bringing a plus to environmental sustainability. Second, th second thing here um, is again represented by the communal meal system. Uh, people have told me that it is more efficient to cook for 26 people than if 26 people would fire up their ovens on their own in their private housing. This is again dependent on the um, frequency of common meals, on the size of the community, on, how, on the average of people taking part in such meals. But in the long term, uh, I, I think in one of the Danish communities, they have estimated that they use, because the whole co-housing setting, 50% less energy. This is just their estimation. I'm, I'm not sure. This is why we would really make use of a strong quantitative study in this regard. But anyway, it shows promise. Uh, another example is that one Danish community for the whole city is the, the site which uses the least water. And they don't have uh, a communal laundry. And they told me that they believe it is because the industrial dishwasher. So what happened is that in um, co-housing communities of over 50 people, let's say, uh, you have industrial equipment in the kitchen, uh, dishwashers, uh, I don't know, cookers, and, and stuff like this, because it's obviously a, a large amount of people you have to cater for. And these tend to be more energy efficient overall compared to uh, each one using their own, uh, their own kitchen. Um, they use less energy due to their shared facilities. Top of the list here is the communal laundry. Uh, research has shown that if you use the washing machine and the dryer less frequent, but you put a higher load, it is much more energy efficient than the other way around, which usually happens in, in homes. And obviously, co-housing community is a medium which, which is uh, optimal for communal laundries. I have noticed this in, in most of the communities I have visited. Um, the economy is a scale, and I think this is the, the crux of the discussion about environmental sustainability in co-housing. In the communities I have visited, I have seen systems ranging from rainwater collection, geothermal pumps, district heating, everything. Polytunnels, raising chickens. And people have told me that it is so much easier to have access to such system if you are a group due to the economies of scale than if you would be on your own. And it's not just about the money, it's also about the support you get from one another of doing things which maybe you would not have, do on your, not have done on your own, like buying a geothermal heating system, let's say. Uh, I remember I spoke to Mark Westcombe, who was one of the um, founding members of Lancaster Co-housing. And they have uh, upgraded their houses to passive standards. And they, he told me like this, that because we were 70 people pooling money together, we found a local supplier who gave us very uh, high, uh, highly efficient materials for our homes. And because of that, we develop, managed to develop our homes at passive house standard at the same price as developing a normal house at a much lower standard in, uh, in the market situation. Mm -hmm. So that is a, an obvious example of what economy of scale can do. He mentioned that he paid in a four bedroom apartment, he paid for the whole winter, for four months of winter, he paid like 50 pounds gas and electricity and we used that like. We use so that in a month or much more than that. And also, if you think about the bulk buying of food, the same example, they are uh, bulk buying food in Lancaster. He told me that because of buying from a retail shop and from a local supplier, they make economies of up to 70% in food. That, is a, that can showcase the potential of using scale to your favor in co-housing. Not all co-housing communities have sustainable system installed. 
but almost all the interviewees have mentioned that this setting definitely allows for a higher possibility uh, to get access to those systems. And not only that, if, for example, you, uh, the co-housing community is, uh, is using the rented ownership model and they're renting from a housing association, it's one thing to come as an individual and demand solar panel. It's another, another weight if you come 100 people in, in the eyes of the landlord. So this definitely, this is a definitely, definite difference compared to mainstream. I have one more minute. One more minute, very fast. Otherwise, not answer questions. <laughs> That's good. I don't want questions. Okay. Oh, so that's not in the inclusive that, nature here. That's that was a joke. Okay. Uh, very quickly, I one of other advantages of the scale of co-housing is the fact that um, they can receive grants or they can have research done in the community, which allows them uh, free access to facility. One example is Spring Hill, where they got solar panels for very cheap in exchange for being researched on their energy consumption for, another, for a number of years. A senior co-housing community in Denmark, in Kulamba, called Head Quartel, uh, they were allowed to develop the community by the local authorities on a sustainable site, but for a much lower price and a fixed one but they were forced by the local authorities to incorporate uh, sustainable systems. Okay, one more minute, <laughs> starting now. Um, I've done my master thesis on um, sustainable neighborhoods on brownfield development in Germany. And I, I showed through GIS analysis and research and archival research that a sustainable quarter, the one in uh, uh, the French quarter in Tübingen, the, the upper part of the, of the image, is uh, faring better for 21 sustainability indicators than a similar developed uh, neighborhood but conventional one. And related to co-housing, and I've noticed this just last week, there are four concepts that are um, existing in co-housing communities which you can find in this sustainable neighborhood in this much wider scale. The parking concept where the cars are coral at the edge of the site and people have to walk. Uh, the possibility to use district heating systems which are three times more efficient than normal ones. Uh, the um, development of green spaces for socializing, so you preserve some spaces for the social sustainability of the whole area and for people to socialize. Also there are similarities regarding their uh, legal entities, like, like their legal formation between the German Baugemeinschaften and co-housing association, the way, the compactness of the building, they built in a sustainable neighborhood based on something called perimeter dwellings, which allowed for the creation of inner courtyard, and I made a parallel to the terrace houses you see in co-housing co communities. So there, this, these similar concepts that exist at a broader scale, in, in my opinion, only emphasize the fact that co-housing communities are, uh, are a more environmental sustainable setting, let's say. And my last slide, if anyone's still awake, <laughs> it appears that at least from the environmental sustainability point of view, co-housing fares better than mainstream options. Um, as, uh, you can notice that especially in the long term. What I've noticed in, in the studied community is that, is that there is a, a need for a quite high initial capital, where the, 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 not only the time development, the years you take to develop the community, but also the, the cost of developing or buying are not necessarily cheaper than in mainstream housing. You get much more for that. But initially, it is not necessarily cheaper. Well, one exception would be social rents, but that, that doesn't happen so often, actually. And, well, until now at least. And, um, maybe for seniors who have a higher initial capital or for housing associations. Uh, if you look at these environmental benefits, at these four categories and 15 factors I have mentioned, it might provide an um, impetus for, for developing them. So from, at least from an environmental sustainable point of view, my last sentence, it appears to be one of the options that the Welsh government seeks for, for the Welsh context. Thank you. Thank you.